Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show, me stead show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. And then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring, wearing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms, weighing ten gold shekels, and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom you she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken the steadfast love and has his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman, and then the young man ran and told her mother's household about these things. Thus far the reading of God's Word this morning. Now I pointed out to you last week that the length of this account is extraordinary and that it provides us with some great detail by which we learn about this girl Rebecca and we begin to see already what kind of girl she is. To summarize this midsection very quickly, the narrative takes us to where the servant arrives near his destination, his targeted destination, and when he offers up this prayer to the Lord, he asks that a certain recognizable sign he might come to know the girl in question very quickly. And right on cue, Rebecca arrives, and she appears to immediately fulfill that sign and satisfy the servant that his search is over, even before he learns her name, even before he knows who she is or what family she comes from. Now, next week, Lord willing, uh, we will see where and how the story develops from there and what else we are to learn from Rebecca and her family, and what shall happen with that interchange. But for now, it seems an appropriate opportunity for us to take an aside, to address the topic of marriage, and to do so with this, uh, with this text in mind, um, to, to ask ourselves three questions about Christian marriage today. Uh, questions that rise up from time to time and questions that need to be answered by our young people and need to be remembered. Now the first question that comes to my mind when I think about this topic is what role should love play in choosing a future spouse? 
What role should love play in choosing a future spouse? You know, for all intents and purposes, this before us is a prearranged marriage. Abraham, the father here, has taken charge over his son's future. He sends his servant to do his bidding. The woman he brings back will be Isaac's wife. Verse 67 tells us that Isaac did uh, indeed come to love Rebekah, and so this arranged marriage comes with a happy ending. Not all arranged marriages turn out so well. One very famous case is, the, is Anne of Cleves, Henry VIII's fourth wife. She was a recommendation by Thomas Cromwell, his advisor. She's a great girl, Henry, you love her. Loads of personality. But Anne displeased Henry so much that he quickly had the marriage annulled and eventually Thomas Cranmer lost his head. I'm sorry, Cromwell lost his head. More often than not, however, in cultures and history where prearranged marriages are common, those husbands and wives don't start out loving one another. They learn to develop a relationship after the fact. Emotional attachment may indeed wait a long time before it finally arrives. Now in our day, in our age, and in our culture, even though the father may want more control, our present society is in no mood for any such thing. Romantic, emotional love is always to lead the way, even entirely. Nothing whatsoever, we are told, should be allowed to stand in the way. These two young people, we are told, have a right to make their own decision, their own choice. And nobody should say anything otherwise. My own wife and I, chose one another before I even met her parents. And if her father had been allowed to arrange his daughter's marriage, I can tell you, I would not even have made the short list. <laughs> now, Scripture is certainly not against marrying for love. I want to get that straight. But what Scripture does teach us is that personal emotional love is not all that should be involved. When one's personal emotional love choice is all that is involved, do you see what's happened in our society? Do you see how the very definition of marriage has been changed? Do you see how the very understanding of what a relationship, like a marriage relationship is, has been now said to be a civil right, and therefore any kind of relationship I can ever create or imagine is an appropriate marriage bond. When love is the only thing that you have to function by, there is no boundary whatsoever to keep you from doing anything you want to do. But Scripture says there indeed are other factors that need to be in play. There are other voices, even authorities, that you must heed before you can make such an important personal decision. The first authority in your life, of course, is the Lord. Young people, and I speak to those in high school and anticipating college primarily, but also those in college, Young people, it is not a coincidence that at a time when you begin to taste adulthood, when you begin to practice your independence, when, when you begin to enjoy the pleasures that the world has to offer without somebody staring at you and frowning, it's, it's no coincidence that just at that time is when you are tempted the most to challenge the authority of God in your life. It's a time when your world is being filled with new and different and exciting people 
And you become tempted to think that enjoying yourself, enjoying your independency, to enjoy the ways and the practices that so many others are doing and seem to be having such fun is something that you should not deny yourself. You might want to come to the decision that Christian marriage is just not realistic for you. That having sex now is in a variety of ways is perfectly fine, perfectly normal, perfectly to be expected. And that even living with a partner before marriage is actually a good or smart thing to do. But the authority of God speaks to that attitude and that choice that you're tempted to make. This is not unto wisdom. It is not an expression of adulthood. It is indeed rebellion. It is sin. It is in fact two sins that you are making. You first choose to reject God, and then you choose to follow Satan. Does that sound familiar? That's exactly what Adam's wife in the garden did. Rejected God, followed Satan. Two sins. Two sins that can condemn you. Now the good news of the gospel here is that you may repent of that if you choose that sin. If you fall to that temptation and you give in to that, you may repent of that. You will be forgiven and you can return with joy to the grace of the covenant of God. But if your response to that idea is nothing more than a carefree attitude, an air of apathy, an air of disregard, you need to be aware of something. And that is that all you are really doing is, den is denying your guilty conscience that is trying to speak to you at the moment. The Lord in His Word is not silent with His instructions regarding marriage and His warnings about your duty to Him in the first commandment, about how that, uh, that, that commandment of God to love Him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength addresses and guards and provides for your friendships and for your sexuality, and about the promise He gives you that by honoring the Lord in your life, he will bring you long-lasting blessings and he, he will see that you avoid long-lasting consequences. And because the Lord must be your number one authority, your entire discipline, your self-control, your thinking about friendships, about dating, about sexuality and relationships must remain submitted to His authority as you face those temptations and challenges in the world. This should also dictate to you how you arrange your priorities in life. And I realize how touchy a subject this is. Too many times, I believe, parents and teens both choose and embrace the priorities of the world and push marriage off for even many years because of the desire to gain other things first. And then, because you have taught your child that marriage is something that can be deferred, it is not something that is of a priority, the te sexual temptations become stronger, the reasons for waiting wane, and the, and the practice begins to compromise and grow stronger and stronger. You must determine ahead of time to honor and respect the Lord's authority and priorities before you face the pressures of romance, of independence, or even of career. Because when you do, if you wait until they are on top of you, you will change your mind. You will reject the Lord's word. You will reject the Lord's priorities. Now, the second authority in your life is that of your parents. When you watch NCIS on television, you know very well that Gibbs has, Jethro Gibbs has his rules for functioning well in 
uh, his work. Well, I have ten rules for Christian young people. And this is number two. My loving parents are my best asset. Write it down. My loving parents are my best asset. Your parents are not perfect. And you may think you are justified for not getting along with them at the present time. But it is only in a very extraordinary circumstance that this rule does not apply to you. The authority and the wisdom of your parents should not be something you readily cast aside just because of something you simply want, something you want to choose to do on your own. This is very true, of course, into your post-high school years. You must remind yourself, my loving parents are my best asset. My loving parents are my best asset. Your parents love you. Your parents have invested in you. They have your back. Right when you feel righteous and casting off all of their restraints is the very time you need to hear their voices the most. Remind yourself often, my loving parents are my best asset. To refuse them, to abuse them, to forget them, is literally like chopping off your right arm. Am I clear? But even when you're older and you're on your own, your parents are still your best asset. The Lord can and will speak to you through your parents. And simply to walk away from their counsel would be a deep, abiding mistake. Even today, marriage is not simple. That's what the TV shows and that's what the movies want you to think. It's not only based on only love, it's only you two that are involved. That is not true. Marriage is always coram Deo. There are three of you in marriage. You marry and you live your marriage before the face of God. But the other thing is, it is also a union of two families. Families who will be with you long after you say, I do. The second question that comes up is what role, that was what role does love have to play? The second question is what role does character and quality play in choosing a spouse? You know, notice the servant's observation of Rebecca here. His prayer test is, is pretty hefty. Offering a drink to a traveling stranger is one thing, but to offer water to his camels. I've heard that a camel can drink 25 gallons in a time. He's brought 10 camels with him. Rebecca has a lot of work cut out for her. And he has seen this appreciably as a character statement. This girl is worth keeping. So now let's reflect on the issue of character as the Scripture teaches it to us. Focusing on the woman. First, Genesis 2 is a good place to go and the description of the wife there being a helper fit. Two words, helper fit. Such a description as that implies much more, you see, than just physical attraction at the moment. I married my wife because she was hot. That's not enough. That's not what a helper fit is. The title speaks of two practical things. First, she is able to meet her own man's needs. She is able to meet her man's private needs. You know, in a casual dating relationship, like what I see so many young people doing today, in a casual dating relationship, emotional, psychological needs, emotional, psychological shortcomings even, 
can and want to hide themselves. Or worse, they are intentionally hidden. Especially if the couple spends all of their dating time in fun groups or sitting there passively being entertained the whole time they're together, together, or rather than talking with one another and praying with one another. If those needs remain hidden until after the wedding, both the man and the woman can be immediately overwhelmed when they come to the surface. by what the spouse truly does need from his spouse, his or her spouse. It's hard. And that spouse finds him or herself completely unprepared to meet that need. When this begins to pressure the relationship, when distance, when silence, when yelling begin to replace companionship and conversation and prayer. It doesn't take long to conclude this marriage is very mismatched. The necessary character is not here. Secondly, not only does it say she must be able to meet her man's own needs, but the helper fit is willing to support the man's aspirations. You know, I know it's very popular today. I know it's the thing to do in many people's minds today to have a two-career marriage. They're very popular. It's a very proud thing to do. You make lots of money. You get lots of toys that way. You retire early. That's your hope. But in reality, such unions really have very little foundation upon which to stand. Christian marriage should probably not be contemplated if the couple will have to work around one another or even if they expect to continue operating absolutely independently of one another as two separate and demanding careers require. Now, while there can be exceptions to this, and there are, it is the wife who must normally be ready to give her full attention, her full devotion to her husband's plan, her husband's circumstances, and her husband's needs so that they can live together as husband and wife. They can, as they say, pull in the same direction. Aim together for shared goals. Well, that's Genesis 2. Another passage we can go to is Proverbs 31. That passage should always be respected and regarded as a valuable description, not only of the excellent wife, but of what the mother should be teaching her daughter, so that she will in turn grow to be an excellent wife herself, one of true godly character. Industrious, capable, and self-assertive. You know, today, I have to say, as I observe so many as pastor, such practical instructions to young girls is often set aside. It's often just neglected completely because the mother is either too busy with her own interests or because she was herself not taught them when she was a girl. And therefore, she has no grasp of what, how it is to be this kind of character. Today, such teaching is often replaced, even in Christian homes, with the modern doctrine of feminism. And if you haven't heard it before, let me underscore it here. My friends, feminism is poison to the next generation. Feminism is poison to the next generation. Young couples, you know, today, they laugh at the prospect that neither one of us knows how to cook dinner. Neither one of us 
knows how to run a home. Neither one of us knows how to handle family business. No, neither one of us knows how to be responsible, knowledgeable with our own finances and our own investments. But these aren't things to joke about. They can be real handicaps. The absence of such character traits, the absence of such wisdom should not be just excused, not just be overlooked, not just dismissed when you are considering a potential spouse. Well, then the third question comes up. What does love have to do with it? What does character have to do with it? The third question is, what role does Christian liberty have to play in choosing a spouse? And here I've got three questions we can answer. First of all, does not the young person have his or her own mind? Is not the commitment of marriage up to that individual? And should not all those who love this person respect his or her own choice and support this union? Absolutely. Absolutely. But while Christian liberty, first of all, means freedom, it also means responsibility. Didn't your parents even teach you that? Let's try it again. With freedom comes responsibility. Yes. Now what do I mean by that? The Bible's teaching is that marriage is to be between one man and one woman and that this commitment, this pledge is to be for life and that the holy bond of marriage is to be the norm. Some, it is true, are called to singleness, but the norm is marital union and family blessing, and so both young men and young women should prepare for that norm in their lives while trusting God for the proper timing. So let me speak about the young men first. Young Christian men, you should take responsibility for your free time. Take responsibility, not just freedom, but responsibility with your free time. Are you listening, young men? Do not take your model for women from pornography. Pornography not only perverts the mind, it makes you antisocial. Instead of learning to be kind, and respectful, and boys need to learn how to be kind and respectful to all the women in your life, young and old as well. Instead of that, you are learning how to regard women as things. Shame on you. And that means your character as a future husband, my friend, is deeply flawed. Do not habitually retreat to watching sports, to playing video games or other idle wastes of time. These just reward your laziness. And my friends, if you're wasting your time on the Lord's Day, it is even worse. If you've attended my, the first module of my leadership college, you know that you must assert yourself. I tell the young men to assert yourself. Step forward. Put yourself forward. If you are to grow in Christian character and strength, you must assert yourself. And to do that, you must be involved with other people. And that should include considering the marital, the marital options that the Lord has providentially put into your midst. It's hard, I know. I'm a boy, too. It's hard, I know, to stick your neck out. It is still the man, however, that must take the lead. And it takes practice. It does take trial and error, if you will, to learn how to be gracious how to be kind, how to be respectful, and to let others know who you truly are. 
No man likes to be rejected by a woman. But the free Christian man must learn how to accept another's feelings rather than demand them. As well as to learn how he is going to make up his own mind as to whether or not any given candidate might truly be a woman under godly authority as well as a woman of godly character. Young ladies can teach Young ladies can have a lot to teach young men, but young men must be willing to learn. Now, young Christian women, you need to be busy and responsible as well. Sarah's daughters should not seek to hide behind the braiding of hair, the adorning of jewelry, or the latest fashions that show off your body. That is vanity. Instead, the gentle and quiet spirit that Peter calls for is not only very needful, you need to know that it doesn't come easily. A godly spirit does not come naturally. It takes work, mostly in terms of self-denial, mostly in terms of denying the world. And yes, that will probably seem to take more time if you do that for the Christian man you are looking at to come around and find you. But the writer of Proverbs 31 bemoans the real truth and the real problem here, girls, and that is this, an excellent wife who can find. Why in Israel, why among God's own people is such a wife hard to find? It's because in the freedom of their own choices, so many daughters of the church have chosen not to be biblically responsible, but to waste their youth in camouflage to attract foolish men with lies. So there you have it. Three questions concerning prearranging your own marriage. Each young person needs to understand the proper answer to all three of those questions. What does love have to do with it? What does character have to do with it? And what does Christian liberty have to do with it? And when you answer those questions and apply them to your life, may the Lord bless you as you see that change your heart and soul. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for how these people have listened. And I pray that you would indeed bless many who are wrestling with these very things. People here as well as people perhaps at home are watching and maybe they're going through these very things. They need the strong word that your, your, your word gives us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for how boldly you speak to us. We aren't ashamed of it and we aren't ashamed to receive it. We thank you, Lord, for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.